What's going on everybody? Mortem here, this time bringing you my Blood Rider build for the Blood Rager class in Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous. Now I want to get this out of the way right off the bat. None of these builds that I'm going to be doing for the game are meant to be like the ultimate mid-max unfair guide type style. If you happen to be new to the channel watching this video first, my goal with these videos is to do about one every week or so, taking a class and showing people how I would play it and then giving a difficulty recommendation just in general. So with that said, if you want to tweak anything with this build, go crazy. That's totally fine. Second, the difficulty recommendation for this particular build is core difficulty. That is to say, this build should do okay on core difficulty. Obviously, you can do anything lower than that. Hard difficulty will be a challenge for you in general, and point blank, this isn't a build I would recommend using on unfair difficulty. But with that out of the way, let's jump into our choices here. So starting out with our obvious choice, we are picking the Blood Rider archetype of the Blood Rager. Now, if you're unfamiliar with how the Blood Rager actually works, it's basically a combination of Sorcerer and Barbarian meaning they combine sorcerer bloodlines with barbarian rage abilities. So the archetype itself as a base is going to make a few changes to Blood Rager, of course. So we're going to lose our fast movement. However, that gets replaced with fast rider, which basically transfers the speed boost from us to our mount, increasing its speed by 10 feet. However, we're not going to get our mount until level 5, despite us actually getting this ability at level 1. As a Blood Rager, we're going to be proficient with all simple and martial weapons, light armor, medium armor, shields, except tower shields, and we can cast our Blood Rager spells without being affected by arcane spell failure chance while wearing armor. Next up, we're going to lose Uncanny Dodge, and of course, we are going to pick up our Animal Companion at level 5. It's important to note you won't get it until level 5, just like you won't get spell casting until level 4. The main thing we're going to be able to do early levels is, of course, our Blood Rage. This is basically rage in every regard, except that it's labeled Blood Rage. Now, initially, we're only going to be able to use it so many times per day, and after we use it, our character becomes fatigued. That's not going to matter after Act 1, because the very first mythic ability you're going to pick up is Limitless Rage, which completely removes the rounds per day from your Blood Rage. Absolutely must have first mythic ability. That said, Blood Rage itself is going to give us a plus 2 bonus on our melee attack rolls, damage rolls, thrown weapon damage rolls, and rule saving throws. However, we're also taking a minus two penalty to our armor class. We gain temporary hit points as well. Now, that's it for the class itself. Next up, for this build, I am enjoying playing an Oread, but again, race and stuff, that's pretty wide open as far as what you want to do. Me personally, though, I like to play a Gym Soul Oread just because I find it very fun. Now, we want to pick Gym Soul specifically for our heritage because this is going to give us a racial bonus to strength and charisma, but a penalty to Wisdom, which is a stat we are not using. Now for our background, I actually recommend picking Gladiator out of everything. Now this is primarily just because we're going to get a competence bonus to our Persuasion, since we already have Persuasion as a class skill. Truthfully, there's not a ton of backgrounds that are amazing for us here, and Gladiator will convert some of that stuff to bonuses for our character. Now next up, we have Attribute. So you actually have a little bit of leeway here depending on exactly how you, how you want to play this. The main thing to keep in mind is that we only need enough Charisma to cast our spells. Outside of that, Charisma is not doing anything for us, but Blood Ragers use spell casting through Charisma. So I would recommend about a 13 or 14 at character creation, and then the rest you need to dump into Strength and Constitution primarily. However, we're not really going to be using Intelligence and Wisdom at all. So I recommend you drop those down to their lowest to get extra points to spend on other things. We're going to take Strength all the way to 20, and we're going to take Constitution as high as it'll go. Now, here's where you have a little bit of leeway. If you only want to put points into Charisma up to like 14, you could then put what's left into Dexterity to give yourself a little bonus to AC, because we're only going Medium Armor with this which means we'll be able to get a little bit of a dex bonus to our AC if we want. And because of the amount of points we'll have left at this point, exactly how many points you're able to actually put into each of these attributes will change a little bit. So it kind of just depends on how much you actually want to prioritize. But me personally, what I like to do is put 20 in strength, leave dex at 10, take constitution all the way up to 16, intelligence and wisdom as far down as we can go, and then take Charisma up to 13. For our skills, we are going to be picking up Athletics and Persuasion. However, with that said, eventually at some point, we will need to put at least one point into Mobility. That is to get mounted combat feats later, because those actually require, or at least the initial one, requires you to have one point in Mobility, but beyond that, Athletics and Persuasion. 
athletics, just because we have a bunch of bonuses for it due to our strength, and persuasion, because we're going to be using a bunch of feats that handle our persuasion. Now, for our starting feat, I like to pick up Weapon Focus Flail. This is because when I think of this build, we are someone mounted on a Smilodon, which, by the way, is the only pet that we're actually going to be able to get as a Blood Rider, riding into battle with a shield as well as a flail. Now, that said, feel free to mix up the weapon variety if you want. However, we do need to pick up Weapon Focus because we are going to be moving into Dazzling Display and things like that later, which require you to pick up Weapon Focus first. So this should be your level one pick. For our bloodline, we're going to pick up Arcane Bloodline. So this is actually one of my personal favorite bloodlines, but basically what it's going to let us do is disrupt enemy spellcasters. First level, we get Disruptive Blood Rage, which means at level 1, enemies within 10 feet of us have a minus 2 penalty on concentration checks, and this will actually stack with the Disruptive feat. Now, we also get some bonus spells for just having Arcane Blood Rage, but those aren't amazing. However, we will pick up Arcane Blood Rage, Greater Arcane Blood Rage, as well as True Arcane Blood Rage. Now that's important because each of those is going to let us cast a few different spells while we are in Blood Rage for free. So Arcane Blood Rage is going to let us cast Blur for free during our Blood Rage, which is going to give us a 20% concealment bonus, which means it's just a flat chance for enemies to miss us. Greater Arcane Blood Rage will let us do the same thing, but with either haste or displacement, and it will stack with Arcane Blood Rage. And True Arcane Blood Rage lets you cast a bunch of transformation spells, which will let you take the shape of like a dragon, smile it on, or uh, just the actual transformation spell. This one's decent, but transformation is the only one that will actually stack with the other two because we are mounted and thus can't turn into something. Now, while it's not really listed here, some other things we're going to get for the Arcane Bloodline are Caster Scourge, which is going to, again, force enemy casters to make concentration checks against a spell with a difficulty of 15 plus double the spell level. And this is an effect constantly. We get that at level 12. And then at 20, we actually get Caster's Bane, which means spell casters within 10 feet of you just immediately fail any attempts at casting defensively. Now the other thing that we get from Bloodlines that isn't actually mentioned right here, it is mentioned on the actual main page of it though, is that we will get bonus feats simply for having the Bloodline as we level up. That's important because that is an extra list of feats that we get to choose from. The most important from Arcane that you need to prioritize are Power Attack and Disruptive, because Disruptive will stack with our first Arcane bloodline feature and then power attack we need as a feat so if you don't have power attack from your regular feats you can get it here and you'll get extra bonus feats every few levels when you level up now that said on your third mythic level when you get the second ability the first one being limitless rage for your third mythic ability i recommend you pick up second blood rage or bloodline which is going to let you take a second one now the second one can really be whatever you want personally i prefer draconic because it gives you a breath weapon which i think is really cool plus you get more bonus feats on top of the feats you've already got so you'll get both of those bloodlines bonus feats for free all of that said let's talk about what we're actually trying to do here now as we level up from here our main goal is to pick up the feats like dazzling display and cornagon smash and dreadful carnage that are going to basically use our persuasion skill that we picked up every time we damage or kill an enemy to make intimidate persuasion checks against the enemy to leave them shaken which is basically like fear and this will happen automatically with those feats, just as we're attacking things. Those checks will automatically happen and will make things feared. Plus, with our mount, which we will have gotten Boon Companion for at level 5, but we'll get into that in a second, our mount is going to be very similar in that we are going to ideally give it Bulwark just to make it a little more survivable since we're going to be right up there on the front lines. Mounted or not, our, our companion here will be with us pretty regularly. So even if you don't actually use it as a mount, you still want to give it bulwark in my opinion because it's going to be very upfront. But our companion we're basically going to do the same thing with. We're actually going to give it persuasion as well and do the same thing with its feats as we did for ours and give it things like power attack, weapon focus for its natural weapon which will be claw or bite because it's a smilodon and use those to eventually get it up to dreadful carnage as well to then have our mount doing the same thing to where our mount and us are basically making constant intimidate persuasion checks against the enemy and potentially leave them feared. In addition to those things, with our arcane blood rage, we're going to be casting things like displacement as well as haste on ourself and our party if we want through our regular spells to make ourselves very hard to hit and very survivable. Now the downside to all of this is that our 
actual weapon attacks, we're just going to be doing okay damage. Like about mid-game level 10, you're going to be hitting for like 30 or 40 pretty regularly. We're not really ever going to crit very often because we're not like focusing in on that. Our damage will be kind of average-ish, but we'll be very survivable and basically making the enemy constantly run in fear if it's not immune to Shaken. Before we go any farther, let's talk about feats as we level up as well as spells for our Blood Rager, and then we'll move on to some combat-oriented stuff. For our companion, as it levels up, actually showing you at about level uh, 13 here, our mount itself, or animal companion, if you choose not to actually use it as a mount, it, don't, it won't actually make much of a difference either way, but you can do like mounted charge attacks with this pretty easily if, if that's what floats your boat. But for our companion itself, uh, again, it has to be a Smilodon. We don't actually have a choice in that. That said, the Smilodon gets a bunch of natural attacks right off the bat, which makes it very good damage-wise. And then combined with the fact that we're going to make it a bulwark archetype, which is an animal archetype, it's going to get barding feats for free at levels 1 and 9. And then we can put barding on it to uh, help it survive, obviously. And then for feats, again, very similar to what we are doing for our main person, which is power attack, weapon focus, dazzling display, dreadful carnage, cornagon smash, blind fight, basically anything to get those persuasion checks off as well as actually try to beef it up as much as possible. We don't really need to do much beyond that because our animal companion will get a bunch of bonuses just from being leveled up. So pretty straightforward for the animal companion. However, for our main guy, our actual feats are a little more important. Now that said, before we even talk about the feats, remember as I mentioned, with our bloodline, we're going to be getting extra feats on top of these. Now you'll get those just from leveling up. You'll basically get that full list for each bloodline. But the main ones to prioritize are the things that are going to get you to the Dreadful Carnage and stuff later, as well as the Disruptive one from the Arcane Bloodline. Because you can get the Disruptive feat as a bonus feat, so you want to prioritize that. As far as our level up feats go, right off the bat, Weapon Focus, Flail, or whatever you want to use. Dazzling Display at level 3, but Boon Companion at level 5. This is important because when we pick up our mount at level 5, it will actually only be level 1 because of how this class works. We're going to grab Boon Companion first thing to bring our companion's level up to our level. Then at level 7, we're going to pick up Power Attack. This is useful in general, but is also a prerequisite for some other stuff. And then at level 9, we're going to pick up Cornagon Smash. Whenever we damage an opponent with Power Attack, we're going to start making Persuasion Intimidate checks as a free action which will just happen automatically as long as you have this toggled on, to attempt to demoralize your opponent, which then leads to Shaken. So this is where you start getting the free ones, whereas Dazzling Display is like an active version of the same thing. And then at 11, we're going to pick up Dreadful Carnage. This is going to give us another Persuasion check to Intimidate to demoralize after we drop an enemy to zero or kill it, basically. From here, starting at 13, you have a little more leeway, because at this point... We should have already gotten basically all of our bonus feats from our bloodlines as well as basically everything we need to do like the mandatory stuff. And at this point, what I like to do is start picking up mounted combat feats. However, I would at some point recommend that you also pick up shatter defenses for a feat. So this will allow us, as long as we are using what we have weapon focus in, to cause any opponent that is shaken, frightened, or panicked hit by us this round to be considered flat-footed to our attacks until the end of our next turn, and that includes any additional attacks we make this turn. Now that's important because later on enemies will have higher AC, and since we're already making enemies shake in anyway, this will effectively make them easier to hit, especially later on. You can push this towards kind of the end there because for the most part you're going to have more than enough to hit as long as you're not playing on fair difficulty. However, later on, Shattered Defenses can help you push more attacks through if you find yourself missing a lot. Now, before we actually jump into some combat, let's kind of just talk UI and our general setup here. Now, overall, we're not going to have a ton of abilities on us. For the most part, what we're going to be using here is simply our Blood Rage. We'll have that set to activate as soon as combat starts, which once we get our first Mythic rank ability, we won't even have to worry about a daily limit on it. We're going to have power attack toggled, and we can't really set it up to uh, just happen automatically, which is frustrating, but we're going to have our arcane blood rage as well as our greater blood rage set to use either blur or displacement. Displacement ideally, and then you can use the first uh, arcane blood rage to give you an appropriate protection for the enemy you're fighting, but at first you'll use blur, and then when you get greater arcane blood rage, you will instead use displacement. And remember, you get these for free simply while being in your Blood Rage. Next up, through either your regular feats or potentially your extra 
bonus feats from your bloodlines. I like to pick up Arcane Strike, which is a toggle feat, just like power attack or something. And basically spending a swift action each round, we can imbue our weapons with a fraction of our power. And basically they deal plus one damage and are treated as magic for the purpose of overcoming damage reduction, provided you don't already have a magic weapon. But that said, this increases every five levels up to a maximum of plus five at 20th level. And because, again, we can get that through our bloodlines as just an extra feat, I like having that as well. And again, it's just a toggle, so you can just turn it on. And because everything else we do uses free actions, we are free to use this as a swift action without conflicting with anything. Now, next up, provided we picked it up as a feat, we can pick up Trample. This is one of the mounted combat feats that I like. And basically, if you're right next to an enemy, like melee range, you can choose to make a Trample attack to try to have your mount trample that enemy. And if successful, your mount knocks it prone as well as deals a natural attack, just one, mind you against the target, which is fun. But again, that's provided you want to pick up the mounted combat feats, but personally, I enjoy that. Now, spells. Spells for our Blood Rager really come down to two that are very important. Now, we will get more spells for this, but these are the only two that I would say are mandatory. Beyond these two, really do whatever you want. That said, we're not gonna get a ton of spells as a Blood Rager anyway, and we're only ever going to be able to cast level four spells. So because of that, we're never gonna do like a ton of damage. So what you want to focus on is utility spells, specifically haste and mirror image. Haste, because it just flat out gives you an extra attack and makes you faster. Not only you, but all of your allies within 30 feet as well. And then mirror image. This is going to further make us tankier. This will be active one minute per level and makes a bunch of illusory doubles that the enemy has to hit before they can hit you, which is just flat out survivability. Those two combined with like displacement and stuff from our arcane blood rage are going to make us very, very survivable. All that said, let's actually talk combat. Mounted combat is a bit of a problem in tight spaces, so you really kind of want to be careful where you use that. So as you can see here, despite me having my mount and everything, I can't really charge or anything like that simply because like it's just tight spaces and I can't get to the enemy. So because of that, unless you're like out in a field somewhere, you're not always going to be able to use the mounted combat. And because of that, you might not want to pick up those mounted combat feats I mentioned earlier, and you kind of just got to decide if you want to use mounted combat or not, but keep in mind it comes with limitations, and overall it's pretty fun. But with that small example out of the way, let's move on to something else here. So here in this fight, we can see that I'm actually on core difficulty right here. I'm fighting a bunch of undead Bodax. I've buffed up. I've casted prayer, uh, protection from evil, and my blood rager has cast mirror image as well as haste on himself. So just kind of letting it play here. Now, while you will start to see some other people die from like negative levels and stuff because I don't have the appropriate death ward up to keep that from happening, you will notice that my blood rager guy here, which is the blue oread portrait there, isn't really taking damage at all despite being on the front lines here. And that is, again, because of all of the displacement and things that we gave to his blood rage that make him incredibly hard to hit. Also, this is around level 10 or so. Now, if we look at our combat log, we can see on pretty much any of our attacks here that we're dealing pretty average damage, nothing too crazy, but most of it's actually coming from our bonuses, even though we are using a plus three flail. And then our actual to hit chance, as you can see, even when we roll like a nine, we still have like 22 worth of modifiers here at level 10 giving us a 31 even though we rolled a 9. And all we had to roll was a 21. And actually, with an armor class like that, even here on core difficulty, with all of those modifiers at level 10, I would hit him no matter what because my modifiers are actually higher than his armor classes. Against these specific enemies, mind you, that would always change, but you can kind of see here what the gist is. But again, our damage itself, pretty average, but we're going to be incredibly hard to hit and very tanky. Again, this is on core difficulty, so let me show you that same fight actually just on normal. And here, again, we're not mounted. We're constantly making our intimidate checks. That said, unfortunately, these guys are actually immune to shaken, which means we're not being as efficient as we could here. However, simply because of all our bonuses and stuff, we're doing a ton of damage just because we're consistently hitting. And then of course, the rest of our party, obviously. Our Blood Rager himself took basically zero damage there. Now, before we actually wrap this up, people are inevitably going to ask about Mythic Paths. There are two Mythic Paths that I would recommend that I think would complement this well, and that is Azada and Angel. Now, honestly, remember, 
There is no wrong choice in terms of Mythic Path. You can play whichever one you want. However, I think what would complement it the best are Angel and Azada. Azada because you're going to get Ivu, who is the dragon companion who can serve as a mount later on, and will obviously have things that kind of lean into that, in addition to all the cool superpower stuff that Azada get as well. If you're curious about what each Mythic Path get, I have mechanics videos where you can check that out separately. I actually kind of wanted to show this separate of a Mythic Path and then just kind of add the Mythic Path stuff on top of it. And then we have the Angel. The Angel's pretty cool because they get a lot of spellcasting as well as uh, weapon bonuses. So you can make your weapon modifiers go even further if you were to pick up the Angel Mythic Path because they get bonuses to that stuff as well, which is really fun. But again, as a mythic path, I would recommend either Angel or Azada. So there you go, guys. If you enjoyed the video, please remember to like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz. But regardless of any of that, truly, just thank you so much for watching. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.